Hello and good evening. Nice that so many people made it here today and I'm very honored to welcome someone on stage who is skilled, very skilled, talented and does wonderful music. Gabriela Montero. Hi and welcome. Hello, hi. So how do you do? I'm okay, I'm very hot like the rest of the world, but aside from that, all right. So did you have a busy day coming here or is it a more relaxed time in your life at the moment? Probably not. Gosh, it's never relaxed. It's always crazy and hectic. I had a concert last night uh, in Rheingau and uh, took the train and I'm here now for just a few hours. Okay. To do this. Yeah. So thank you that you made it. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So as you just mentioned, um, having a hard life, being traveling around the world all the time, you have a family. But when, when you, st you started very young, I read mm -hmm. that you did your first public performance with, in the age of five. Mm -hmm. Did you play piano at that time? Or? Yes, only piano, always piano, oh. yes. So in the first concert at eight. Yeah. So when was the first moment when you decided, okay, um, I want to be a musician, I want to play the piano, I want to make it a big part of my life? It wasn't quite like that for me. I mean, I, I was playing the piano when I was 18 months old already. So I was a very, very early, early. Really? Yes. Yeah, but actually playing at that okay. point. Um, so music was always very much, very evidently who I was, you know, a musical animal. Uh, then my first concert when I was five, my, my first concerto performance when I was eight. And even though it was very clear that that was, it was what I was born to do, it wasn't very clear to me for a long time that that was what I wanted to dedicate my life to because one thing is making music, another thing is living the career and the lifestyle, which is, is, has its complexities. No? So music has always been an integral part of, of who I am and what I'm made of, but you make choices in life. And mm. it was really, I have to say, really about 15 years ago when I fully committed after a life of concerts and competitions and everything, when I said, okay, I'm there a hundred percent. That's my job. So, um, but but did you come came from a or did you come from a sort of like mus musical background? Did your parents sort Not of push all. you into it? Not at all. No, it, but it you was... had a piano at home. Well, no, we didn't actually. Okay. We, my my mother bought a little toy piano for my first Christmas. I was seven months old, and she put it in my crib, and uh, she would sing to me at night to put me to sleep. My parents noticed that I was starting to play all these melodies. Uh, you know, during the day I would spend hours with the piano, and uh, and that's how it started. They they realized that this is what I was doing. My favorite pastime was being at the piano, and when I was 18 months, I was playing all of these songs. So um, no one pushed me. It was just a very organic kind of um, uh, beginning, let's say, with music. So and they were never frightened, like, what, what, what the hell? We have <laughs> well, a little piano and she's seven months old and she can already start to play. Yeah, there was probably a bit of that, I think, okay. you know, kind of unusual. And what do you do with this? You know, how do you raise this kid? How do you yes. give it what, what, she, you know, what she needs? How do, you, how do you not push a child like that, but at the same time motivate them? And especially, how do you not lose that sense of wonderment of, mm -hmm. of making music? Because it's... It's, in the end, it's not really a job. It's it's a it's a, a vocation. It's almost like being a priest or a nun. It's that kind of commitment. Okay. Yeah. So, but you had to rehearsal because you're well worldwide known. You're very famous. You're very good. So you had to do a lot yeah. of rehearsals. So was there never, especially when you were a teenager, this sort of thing, ah, I hate to practice, I want to do something else? Well, the thing is that I have had a very unorthodox life in that way. I was never one to practice a lot. I, I never was. In fact, I saw a friend of mine the other day that I studied with in London when I was there from the age of 20 to 25. We were together at the Royal Academy of Music and we were kind of, you know, reminiscing of what those years were like. And, and he said, you know, I remember you never used to practice. You used, always used to be at the bar with all of us talking and sharing stories and, and wanting to, to live life. And I think that's an incredibly important part of being a musician or an artist. You have to have stories to tell in, in order to say something with the instrument. So, you know, it wasn't really a very much about practicing, but just absorbing inspiration in different ways. So, but the other students must have hated you because they were practicing all the time and you were at the bar and you were well, such as the, good as they probably are? There are all kinds, I have okay. to say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's no formula. So, um, 
you said you, you studied for five years in London um, at the Royal Academy. Um, how was that? Was it um, besides having sort of like a, a live and bring into mm. your music? Because when you listen, when one listens to your music, you can feel it's not just playing very, very good. There's more into it. You bring yeah. all your personality and all your mm. feelings into the music. But um, when, when studying, um, how was the studying besides mm -hmm. not practicing so much? But was it a, an inspiring time? Did you learn a lot? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely a, a development uh, in a very different phase of my life. Um, I was fortunate enough to be there with a wonderful pianist and teacher, Hamish Milne. And he was a great inspiration because I came from 10 years, you know, from the age of eight until 18, of being in an environment where I had no inspiration. I was with the wrong teacher for all those years. And I really was missing the, the answer to the question, why do I want to do this? No? So when I went to Hamish, um, I felt as if, even though I was not the kind to practice, you know, four, five, six hours a day, I still got a lot from his classes because he himself is a very inspiring musician. So I think I became very receptive to, to what was around me, to, um, to other people's uh, somehow expressions as well. And, and you take, you know, especially in your formative years, you take a lot from here, from there, and you kind of become this person that is a collective kind of impression of everything that you have lived and everyone that you have known. So as you said, you had the wrong teacher for, for a pretty long time. Mm. Um, so it's, it's very important to have someone who sort of like sees you and feels you and can yeah. give you mm -hmm. as much input as possible. Yes, absolutely. And it allows you the freedom to discover yourself. I think that the more interesting artists are the ones that really uh, not only commit 100% on the stage, but really tell stories. And I mean in the most human of ways, you know, it doesn't, it's not about perfection, it's not about a goal, it's not about career, it's about telling the stories of who we are as human beings and relative to how it was in the past and who we are today as well. So that yeah. makes it lively and vibrant. It makes so it real. Yeah, you know? okay. That's, that's really all that matters. Okay. Yeah. So um, besides playing everywhere with, in the world with all these big orchestras and conductors and famous people, is there a special place you, which is sort of like your favorite place? And if so, why? One of my favorite places where I'm playing now on the 10th of July actually is Wigmore Hall because it's, it's a jewel of a, of a small intimate hall in London with perfect acoustics, uh, a beautiful piano and, and just the perfect setting for a recital. That's one of my favorite places. Um, I think that for me it's not so much about the place but just uh, the, the energy, the people, the public, the, the fact when you feel as an artist that the public is really receiving what you're trying to give to them, it becomes a very communal experience. And I personally love that. I don't like the artists here, the public there. I like it to be a, an encompassing mm -hmm. kind of you know, welcoming experience for everyone. That's not very common in the classical world because when you, you normally, mm -hmm. if there's a normal way, you normally yeah. are just the audience and then mm -hmm. there's the artist, he's pretty skilled, he plays or yeah. she plays, but there's normally not really sort of like a connection really between the audience and the, 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 the people on stage. And if one yeah. sees your concerts, mm -hmm. it's, you're, you're almost like inviting people to, to contribute. No, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think we, it, things are changing, fortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be, of course, in the time of, you know, Chopin and Liszt and, and you know, in this kind of, um, in the past, the whole idea of the artist as being the improviser, the composer, the performer, the, the, the salon setting and this intimate way of making music was very much something that, that was in the past. Then we went through a period where it was very much the, you know, the, the artist, the deity almost, and then the public. And now I think newer artists are, are understanding that people want to connect, they want to communicate. And they want to communicate with you as well. So I think there's more of an openness about that now. Mm. And I, I'm, I'm really happy about that. But, but wasn't it difficult when you sort of found out that you liked this sort of connection and mm -hmm. there's somehow talking with the audience? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many people who don't like that. Was it difficult to find your way in, in this classical world with the way you 
do mm. things? Well, you can only be who you are in the <laughs> end, you know? So I, I've just presented myself as I am. And uh, in these last years when I have been improvising so much on the stage and people know me for that too, uh, thanks to the incredible motivation of Martha Argerich, you know, the, the great Martha who just made it very simple to me. I wasn't, I wasn't improvising in public for many years, mainly because that teacher I had as a child said to me not to do it. So I, I put it away, I locked it up, it was my secret. And uh, she said to me, Martha said, just do it, just, just share it with the world, you have to share this. So it was never a point of, I want to do things differently or I want mm -hmm. to be a niche, this or, no, it was about being myself and presenting myself to the world in every way that I am with my qualities and my flaws. And, um, and that's very much what, what I am on stage, the same person that I am off stage. So was it difficult? Well, I mean, I guess some people like it in a different way, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I really advocate for, for just being 100% uh, authentic in what you do and what you say. And then, you know, either people will follow you or they won't. There's nothing you can do. You know? Yeah. Um, so do you remember the first time when you improvised on stage? I was a little girl. I was a very little girl. I don't remember. I know people who were there. I was three years old. Oh my and, God. And uh, I've actually one of my closest friends now was in that uh, little performance. Um, and, and I don't remember, but I always remember this feeling of, of complete liberation and complete, absolute, um, how can I say, giving myself to something. And that's what I feel when I improvise. Mm. So how, what would you say when you, when you play a concert, how much, not really figures, but how much is improvisation and how much mm. is sort of like playing what you... What is written? Something well, someone else wrote? Traditionally, my recitals are, the first half is always written works. Like mm -hmm. last night I played uh, Schumann Carnaval, I played the Schumann Fantasy and I played the four Schubert Impromptu Opus 90. And then I did improvisation. So I never touch the written score. I completely respect composers. Mm -hmm. I can only try and reproduce to the extent that I can their intentions. And that's what I'm there to do. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to improvisation, then I go wherever I want. And that is very separate from, from the first half of the concerts. Yeah, I've seen some, some, some clips uh, on the internet mm -hmm. and there were people yeah. just standing up and saying, Singing a song, actually, it was Harry Potter theme. And oh, you were on stage, yeah. like, ah, I, I, I remember that, what, what is it? And then someone mentioned Harry Potter and you said, yeah. oh, okay, and then you played it. So you, how, how does it work for me being not a musician? Right. You must have tons of music in your head. No, not really. That's okay, so, that's... So, so tell me how does improvisation really works? Because it must be somewhere in your head. For me, it's not about that okay. at all. In fact, it's interesting because we, we just did a, a neurological study, an MRI, a two-hour MRI study on how my brain behaves with improvisation as opposed to the written pieces, no? I can't say too much right now because it's going to be part of okay. a documentary, but I can tell you that it has now been proven that my brain behaves completely different when I play a written piece than when I improvise. In fact, it's like it's a different brain. It's different parts of the brain are used. And that's what I have always said in very simple terms. My explanation has always been that I feel like I get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty okay. much what happens. Parts of my brain shut down. So that explains exactly what it is I have been feeling all these years. And you know, with improvisation, there's nothing planned. There's nothing formulated. There's absolutely nothing that exists before I improvise. And I asked the public for a theme only because it's the best way for them to understand that I am creating it in that moment. Mm -hmm. And also because it makes them a part of the process. But I don't need the theme from the audience. It's just that it's nice to see that relationship with them. Ah, okay. And they love to see the theme that they gave me bounce around in the improvisation. Um, well, one other thing one can see mm -hmm. and probably hear when listening to your music is that um, you're pretty open, especially in the improvisation, of course, yeah. to other musical styles, let's call it like this. It's, it's, there's a bit jazz in there. So you're, you're sort of turning down the borders of yeah. real classical music. Well, 
Well, I mean, you know, I think music, um, music is a universal language. It doesn't matter which style it is. As long as it's, it's good quality music and it's something that inspires, I think it's very valid, whatever genre it is. Um, my improvisations today are mostly classical. I would say, you know, I, I do seven minute fugues and I do very classical improvisations. It depends also what I have been listening to. Um, it depends what I have been playing, but, um, you know, I, I don't d discard any kind of music. Um, I'm open to all of it, really. So because as we just talked before, it's the boundaries mm -hmm. in the classical world are sometimes really strong. So going into improvisation, mm -hmm. okay, but going into other musical styles like jazz, well, I, yeah, sometimes the, the people just say, how can she do that? Well, why not? I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah, sure that if, if Mozart, you know, was alive, he, he would love to be sitting, mm. you know, in a, in a bar improvising, uh, you know, one of his concerti in a different style. But it's, it's really about inventiveness and it's about recreating music in many different ways and forms and, and pushing those barriers. Of course, if you're going to play a Beethoven sonata, you're, you're not going to play it as, as you would improvise, you know, a ragtime, of course. So, so it's about giving each music its space in its respect and, and acknowledging that it stands by itself and you don't have to, it doesn't have to pollute the other ones. They can be individually excellent. Do you listen to a lot of music from different styles? Um, you know, I get asked this question a lot. <laughs> I don't listen to that much music only because um, my head is a radio. It's a 24 hour radio. I feel like I am living in a movie with my own soundtrack all okay. the time. It's that must be very, hard. It's very, <laughs> it's very strange because it just never stops, even when I'm sleeping. Uh, sometimes, in fact, it wakes me up because I get so into it that I somehow it become alert, no? Um, but I, I, I don't, I do listen to music, but then I, I, I have to pay complete attention to it. I can't do anything else. And I can't drive if I listen to music. Okay. I, <laughs> so no I ironing breathe. and listening to music and all this typical thing people um, like to listen to music to? I, I just get too absorbed. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. Yeah. That's really interesting. So there's so much music in your head, yeah, which needs, of course, to come out. Which, of course, is the reason why I couldn't turn my back to, to being a musician. You know, it, mm -hmm. was, it was so evident that despite my complaints and I don't, I don't want my life to be like this, or I don't want that, da, 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 da. you know, the, the concert uh, musician life is incredibly, uh, you have to have a lot of stamina, you have to have good humor, you have to be able to play without sleeping, without eating, without anything, and just be there 100% or close to it as much as possible. So it's the music in my head which made it impossible for me to do anything else. Okay, so yeah. but why do you need good humor? For the concert life? <laughs> well, because a lot of things happen, like late trains and ah, okay, you know, so missing concerts because of that, or you know, national strikes in a country you can't get out and oh, things okay. like that, you know. So you have to you have to be very flexible. Okay. I can imagine that you can do that. <laughs> um, is it because you said you, you have there's always music in your head, is this the reason why besides doing these improvisations, besides mm -hmm. playing written pieces, you also started to compose? Yeah. Well, because it's, uh, na it's a natural thing. It for was me. a natural progression, yes, um, for me. Uh, it began with Expatria, of course, uh, in my new album. I wrote this piece in 2011 because I felt that I really had to express on paper and for posterity what I felt, and many millions of Venezuelans feel, is the total destruction of, of my country. So this piece really represents a whole generation and a whole period of history in Venezuela. And music, in my opinion, should serve to highlight and to stress situations that are happening to us today as well. I mean, I don't think an artist should just be someone who is there to entertain or to mm -hmm. be a fantasy to the public. I think we have to be somehow reporters of the time, photographers of, of the time that we live in and the issues that are important. So um, that was my first composition. And um, now I'm actually finishing my, my first piano concerto, which I'm premiering next year in Leipzig in, uh, in February with the MDR Leipzig. And that's a completely different piece. Um, crazy as well, uh, but uh, it, it's a process that I really, really enjoy. 
There must be a big difference in being a pianist and playing stuff mm -hmm. someone else has written and playing your own stuff. Isn't it is it? very, very strange, especially for me, the, the way that I compose is very much be based on improvisation. It's just large chunks of crazy improvisation, which then I can, you know, I can craft as I want. Uh, and the funny thing is that even though I write this music, I have to learn it. And okay. that then takes the other side of the brain. So I have to look at this and first say, God, why did I make this so difficult? And then think, well, I can't complain to the composer because I wrote it. And then <laughs> I actually have to learn it, you know? So, um, so it's a very interesting, very strange process. Coming back to the political thing you just mentioned, I think you, you, it's, it's a quote from you, silence is not an option. Mm -hmm. So yeah. being this person who sort of like says things on, or sees things politically or what happened mm -hmm. in your country and to bring it to the audience, how does people react to that? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's something, it's just not music you can normally just easily listen to, but right. it's, there's more into it. Well, you know, in, in the way that I see it, it's not even political, it's really humanitarian. I mean, okay. I am now very honored to be the first Amnesty International Honorary Consul. So this is very much an ambassadorship position mm -hmm. with this fantastic organization. Um, the people working there are amazing. I mean, what they give, their, their lives, everything that they give to, to help uh, situations that, that, sh that have to be have to be somehow exposed is mm -hmm. incredible. And I feel that I have no excuse because I'm an artist to be exempt from, mm -hmm. from speaking of these issues that matter to me very much. I think on the opposite side, um, an artist should be someone that uses their voice, their gifts, their sensitivity, their ability to inspire and their ability to convince, to open people's eyes and hearts I think we should absolutely use that to, to benefit those who can't. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it's, it's not really a political discourse as much as it is an empathy discourse, mm -hmm. where something is terrible is happening, don't turn the other way. And this recording very much is about, even the photograph in the cover is about, don't look away, mm -hmm. don't stop listening, and just please care and pay attention to what is happening. So how do, and how do the people, especially in Venezuela, react? Well, they're very grateful, they're very thankful that, um, that they have a voice. You know, there are, there are many great Venezuelans really working very hard um, to, to change the situation. Um, but I, I think that, you know, the, the bad side, the, the negative side is, of course, that you expose yourself to things that you would never expose yourself if you were just an artist. You know, mm. I've, I've always said that, it would be so much easier for me to just be the concert pianist. I wouldn't have to worry about anything but you know, my concerts and reviews and engagements. This has added an extra dimension that is very difficult actually to deal with, this, this, this struggle. But I, I guess it comes down to you're either the type of person that looks away or you're the type of person who can't. Mm -hmm. And that's like that, you know? Yeah, and to, to, to bring it, or to, to say it very, smooths it enriches your music as well it's sort of it's it's both sides it's it's a statement for the audience yeah. but it's also one can feel listening to the music especially expatria that yeah. there's something which is really yours and oh, yeah. your, your urge to bring it to the world it's very personal it's very urgent um you know i could sit here for hours and tell you anecdotes of stories that i've been told by people terrible things um, even things that have happened, you know, to my own family and to friends. Um, music is very much for me now in this period of my life. Um, an archival, a real, a present and constant reminder of who I am and who the people that I am in contact with are. So it's very much, it's a very real situation. Mm -hmm. Very much like I said, a photograph. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your CD, which is mm -hmm. out now. Yeah. There's Expatria on it, but there's yes. also Rachmaninoff. Yes. Um, why Rach Rachmaninoff? Because he, he was also in exile, and you're mm -hmm. somehow in exile as well. Mm -hmm. So, but why, where does the connection come from? Because there's so many other 
Russian or wherever mm -hmm. people, yeah. uh, composers coming from? What's your special connection? Well, I mean, I, I always loved this concerto. I, I love Rachmaninoff, I have to say. And, and this concerto has always, has been with me since I was 12, 13 years old. So it's a piece that, that is very much has grown up with me. Um, I wanted to, to make a recording that had a thread that had somehow a message, the Trojan horse being the message of Venezuela through Expatria, of course, and then the message of composer-performer. And Rachmaninoff was one of the best examples of composer-performer um, and improviser. So um, I just felt that there was a kinship with him. And I have, always have. I, I adore his music. I wanted to bring his warmth and his passion and his pain also to the recording, and a piece that is very recognizable and very beloved by everyone in the world. Mm. Yeah, it's very famous. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. And very, oh. It's so heartfelt, yeah. and it's, it's, you know, you can just, it's an x-ray of the man, really. <laughs> yeah. So, but he's not your favorite composer, or is, is there a favorite One of, one of, definitely. Okay, one of. Yes, yes. I'm going through a big Schubert phase right now, so. <laughs> okay. He's definitely, Does yeah. it change over the years, so is yeah. it? Two years, it's Schubert, and then you... Yeah, it depends find... on your life. It depends okay. what you relate to, what, okay. what vibrates, you know, to your wavelength, let's say, as a musician. Um, and, and right now, I'm, I'm completely in love with Schubert, and, and of course, Bach always, and Schumann I'm playing a lot of. But, um, but in the recording, I, I liked the parallels between Rachmaninoff, as you say, later in life, you know, he lived exile as well. And, and the, the parallels historically as to mm -hmm. you know, what is happening now, what is happening then, et cetera. Maybe we ask the audience. So yeah. is there, are there any questions to Gabriela? And if so, um, please, please ask them. <laughs> ask them, of course, yes. and raise your hand yeah. and wait for the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I only didn't understand the first composer, your favorite composer. Oh, no, that I love Rachmaninoff very much, but I'm going through a through a big Schubert phase, and of course Schumann as well. But um, like I said, it changes. And but Rachmaninoff has always been a constant, someone that I relate to very much. So the Philharmonie, maybe six years ago. Yes. When you were uh, making this double CD that night. Oh yes, yes, yes. I bought it, of course. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank God. It's not you. for sale. It's very, very good live thank recording. You. Thank you so much. What thank year you. was it? Do you remember? No. Here at the Philharmonie, um, that must have been 2011, actually, maybe. maybe. 2010, 2011. I bought yeah. all, nearly all your records. Oh, well, thank you. That's <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> so, are there any other questions? Questions? <laughs> Everyone is. Ah, there. Yes. May I ask you, are you very much into opera? Mm -hmm. and into opera themes, because I would love to hear an uh, um, improvisation about a theme from Meistersinger from Nuremberg, uh -huh. from Richard, Richard Wagner, and therefore the question, are you very much into opera? I, yes, I'm married to someone who used to be, or still is, an opera singer, a wonderful baritone, so definitely opera is very much uh, in our home. Um, I'm happy to improvise on anything as long as people sing it to me, because for me to remember like that everything it's almost impossible, just because I go into a, 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 an empty space when I do. But um, I love opera, and I, and I think there's some fantastic uh, singers today. And uh, definitely a big conversation in the house is who's doing what, who has this kind of voice, this kind of tessitura, etc. Yeah. Anyone else? No, I like very much this improvisation you did that concert night yeah. for the children who's singing for Elisa and yes. things like that, yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. still do that same thing? Well, I, I, it's always... Life, I mean life. Always different, always different. Every situation, every concert is a, a total invention of new people, new characters, sometimes folk music that they sing to me I've never heard before. Uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's what's so beautiful, it's so spontaneous and anything can happen, anyone can say anything, so, yeah. Yes. Hi, Gabriela. Hi. Uh, could you tell us about your compromise and your work about the situation in political situation in Venezuela and your piece, Expatria? Yes, I mean, of course. Um, Expatria, um, uh, I wrote in 2011 to 
bring attention to the 19,336 victims of murder that year. Uh, last year, there were 25,000 murders in a country of 29 million people, which means that if you take the United States population and the European uh, Union, the other European countries, uh, you have a total population of 816 million. Venezuela has 29 million. We had 3,000 more murders in Venezuela than all of the United States in all of the European community, uh, countries. It's a, it's a crisis, it's a tragedy, it's something that is completely unacceptable, and what I try to do as a musician in my concerts, in the press, um, I have to say with, with uh, potential risks, is really to highlight um, a situation that should not be in silence, that should be exposed. Um, you know, my country is going through, through a period of incredible violence and violation of human rights on every level. And, uh, and as an artist, I feel that my responsibility is to really not look away from it, but on the contrary, very much be a voice and a messenger about it. I'm Sorry? I'm hearing. You're hearing? Expatria. Yes? Can we hear it? Can you hear expatria? Mm, I don't know if we no, can, no? not through this way, unfortunately, but... Um, there's the CD. There's the CD. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say. No, it's a really wonderful recording because um, I chose to do it with the um, YOA Orchestra of the Americas. And this is an orchestra that is made up of top talents of all of the Americas. And it's an orchestra that, you know, because of the different countries, and there's a lot of Mexico, there's Colombia, there's the States, etc. But a lot of the musicians really related to what expatria means because they themselves are going through similar situations. So they really put every inch of themselves into performing and recording this piece. And uh, it was, it's a recording that is a very personal statement and where I think nobody was there just playing the notes, but mm. it was really almost a matter of life and death. It, it was a message that had to get out and it had to get out in the most powerful way possible. And one could definitely hear that on the recording. It's yes, quite I, I it's think very so. intense. It's very intense. Yeah. Yes, it's definitely not for the faint hearted. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So um, just one going back to, because you said you're um, working for Amnesty International now. So yeah. they came to you and asked you, um, mm -hmm. and what do you actually do there or for them? Well, um, of course, Amnesty is a, is a volunteer-based organization. Everybody is working there because they believe in it mm -hmm. and because they are the kind that don't turn the other way. Um, my role is really, um, you know, not only to, to continue to speak about Venezuela, but also to speak on behalf of other campaigns that mm -hmm. they are doing incredible work with. I mean, there are so many things happening in the world that are just deplorable, that, that, that cannot be... In, in silence, in darkness, people have to know. I think awareness and um, somehow uh, personal, what's the word, involvement is so important to put an end to, to tyranny anywhere mm -hmm. in the world in any way. Um, and what I do with Amnesty is, is just basically, we, we're trying to work together so that I can help them as much as I can and that somehow what I can do as a musician to spread the message, to spread the word, just to lend support, mm -hmm. basically, is, is, for me at this point of my life, is, is absolutely necessary, indispensable. I, I, how can you say no to, to all these people that mm. are suffering? You can't. And it's a big inspiration as well, for, for you, of course, as well, but, yeah. but also for the audience, because it's always good when someone mm. who is in public yeah. And you can feel that he's that, yeah. that he's ser he or she is serious about mm -hmm. something and brings it to the world. Oh, of course. And and in the end I think people people do care very much. It's just yeah. that you have to make them notice it. You have mm. to bring attention to it. And I have to say that 99% of people that have heard me speak or know what I'm doing and you know, not only as a musician but as a human rights uh, advocate are very supportive. I, I think the times of people saying, oh, but you're an artist, you shouldn't talk about those things. I think we're past that because mm. we live in an era of 
incredible immediate information where everything is known, everything is exposed within seconds, where a photograph and, and, and visual evidence is out there for everyone to see, and no one can say that they didn't know. Now we live in a, in a time of information, and um, people are, are very much supportive of having a voice lend their time, their space, their art, really, to, to these causes. So having all this in mind and sort of taking care of it and bringing it to the world, how, mm -hmm. what would you think? Is there, it sounds a bit strange, but do you still have this little amount of hope that especially in Venezuela something will change in the near future? Or is it, is it more like a depressing thing still because you can see that nothing is really changing and you have to, have to wait probably for a long time? I think it's a difficult time. I think, I think we are getting closer to a transition. Mm -hmm. And in the end, what I want, like so many Venezuelans, is a Venezuela that is good for everybody, where every person can live with dignity, can live with their basic needs um, successfully fulfilled and successfully somehow giving them a future, giving the youth a future as well. Um, I think it's, it's, I don't know how long it's going to take. I know that there are incredible people that are really, like I said, every day uh, fighting to create that change, a positive change. Uh, that's, that's all we want, a positive mm -hmm. change. Um, depressing, there are many depressing aspects to this, yes. Um, expatria is somehow an embodiment of that, you know, it's very depressing. It ends with a gunshot. The last note of the piece is a gunshot. What I hope is that one day I can, I can write somehow a conclusion to Expatria, mm -hmm. which will be the rebirth of Venezuela, something very different, mm -hmm. something where justice and where harmony and where respect of human life exists, and a transition into, into that Venezuela that we are trying to create. Let's hope that you will write this piece one day. Well, I have everything ready. I have everything <laughs> okay. ready for that, yeah. So, um, one last question, um, because you, we just were talking about the future. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you see your future as a musician? Is it still this mixture, this very lively and very special for you mixture between improvisation, composing, playing yeah. written, written things? Yeah. Or is there a little aspect where you have never went before, and you, but it's still on the list, like composing for a movie or whatever? I don't know. I would love to compose for film. Actually, that's one thing that I would really love to do. I just did two live improvised scores to two silent films, to Battleship Potemkin and also oh, okay. Faust just a few days ago. Uh, that was a fantastic experience. I, I just throw myself into it and this thing is created and, and I'm just so inspired by the images and the storyline and, and you know the, the very dramatic actors and what they're saying no, with their faces. Um, I love that, I love that. I think my, my path will always be a very creative one. Um, of course, the composing and the performing is, is very much this new phase of my life, very much what this disc also represents that transition into a more mature artist and somebody who has very clearly defined her parameters as a musician, as a human being. Um, and and I, I don't know, I, I, we can never know what the future is. All I know is that I hope to continue to create and create and, and hopefully inspire positive change as well through all of this. Mm -hmm. You have a slight tendency to Russians. <laughs> Russian, because it's <laughs> oh, that's again true, that's and true. Maninov, so it's yes. probably it's it's yeah. the it's yeah. the deep thing about the soul, and it's always like really deep-hearted yeah, and definitely. not this lightly. Definitely, <laughs> there's there's probably something there. Yes, yes. I mean, incredible literature, incredible music, incredible people. Of course, no. Um, but but I just basically for me the things that move me are, are things that are real, things that are. Mm -hmm really human, and, and that's what I love about the composers, the, the fact that in their music they display this range of humanity in, in, their, in their most uncomfortable ways, in their most sublime ways as well, and the humor can sometimes be rude, sometimes be, uh, you know, uh, repetitive, it can be relentless, like with Beethoven, 
and then you have somebody so so tender and so poetic in a different way as Schubert. So telling the stories of the of the human beings behind it is is really what captivates me. So um, mm. we wish you good luck for Thank everything you. you plan and Thank do you. and Thank bring you. to the world. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.